I'm Alan Wardis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think People. My guest today is Dr. David Rothman. If the kinds of uh, interactions that we're engaging in are based upon short, merely on short bursts, very, very short bursts of information, uh, you wind up with what many people have understandably called a culture of distraction rather than a, a culture of concentration. And if you're going to have a free, open, and democratic society, and you're going to have cultivate the ability to listen. So uh, it's not a happy development. Not a happy development. Welcome to another great conversation on Think People. If you like Think Radio Presents Think People, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think Business is a weekly discussion with innovators, entrepreneurs, disruptors about sustainable business into the 21st century. And Think Planet, conversations with thought leaders on important environmental issues. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes and YouTube or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. My guest today is Dr. David Rothman. He's a widely published and respected poet, writer, educator, scholar, and also plays a mean jazz piano. He currently serves as resident poet at Colorado Public Radio and is the director of the graduate program in creative writing at Western Colorado University. Beyond all that, Dr. Rothman is a deep thinker about an ancient technology we like to call language and its role in human evolution, both past and present. David, thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me here. Always a pleasure. You know, it, it won't come as any surprise to hear us say that the world is undergoing huge change these days. Our culture, everything ab about our lives seems to be in a state of flux. Um, and in fact, our programs here at Think Radio are all devoted to really examining that change and asking ourselves some hard questions about what it all means. You know, so I've had economists and scientists and politicians and other artists in to talk about that, but I'm really interested to include the perspective of the poet. Because we think of change in terms of environment, socioeconomic changes, cultural changes, but really change can be more fundamental than that. And you and I have talked about this before, and I'd love to have this discussion about ways in which language itself is undergoing change at this particular um, junction in human history. What are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, let's start small. Hmm. Yeah. We only have a, half an hour, you know. It's a big set of questions. There certainly is quite a bit of change going on. I think there have been other periods in the history of the world when there were greater linguistic changes at work. Um, you know, the Norman invasion, for example, when the French came in, the, the Normans came in and mm -hmm. destroyed the entire political structure of England, and, and the language then went underwent tremendous transformation because the ruling class was literally replaced. <clears throat> then in Shakespeare's time again as well, of course, there are tremendous changes. The introduction of printing caused tremendous changes. Uh, Shakespeare, uh, this number is now contested, but Shakespeare arguably introduced as many as 1,500 words into English for mm -hmm. the first time in, as far as we know, in writing, although he was clearly picking up on lots of uh, popular use. That being said, we are in a time of change. I'm not sure it's as great as those changes were, but it is very substantial. I suppose we should begin by defining the modalities of language, which everyone has to use. And it's fair to say there are two modalities, each of which has two, uh, two functions. You have spoken language, and then you have the written language. Right. Or you have writing, because uh, the relationship between writing and speech is different in different cultures, say in Chinese, where you don't have an alphabet. Uh, that relationship is, is quite different and always has been. 
But dealing with European languages and with English, with America, with our own country, you could talk about with spoken language, you have listening and you have speaking. And then with writing, you have reading. Or with the written word, you have reading and you have writing. They're really quite different. They're not merely imitations of each other. And the history of how they they came to be what they are is long and complex and not what most people think, uh, I expect. Uh, so uh, we we if we were going to talk about how these things are changing, I'd suggest separating them a little bit. And, well, and yet, but before we do that, one of the things that people have noticed is that in the age of social media, what is written has come to mirror what is spoken very closely. For instance, on uh, uh, a text message where those are written communications, and yet they're very verbal in style and tone. That they may be. I, there are some distinctions, however, that I, I would make. Here's an example. Um, and it's not a happy example, I'm afraid, because there are some very strange and interesting and dangerous developments. For One of these is the creation of the electronic mob, for example, which we see throughout our culture. Uh, people can now write things and send them completely anonymously, and millions right. and millions of people do so. Our new technologies enable us to... to uh, all be anonymous authors. And it seems pretty clear that when people can do that, uh, they don't necessarily behave very well. And we see a lot of uh, extraordinarily challenging social phenomena arising out of this, right up to the level of attempting to influence the elections in other countries and the social life of other countries through specifically targeted kinds of campaigns sure. because you can't track uh, authors. So writing this, this, this very, very efficient, very fast uh, crowdsourced form of anonymous writing, while it has certain kinds of advantages, and you mentioned one, uh, at the largest social level, it, it actually presents tremendous challenges, uh, even national security challenges. Well, and so there's that level, certainly, the macro, but even down an interpersonal level, it's presenting a lot of challenges. Absolutely. A good example of that would be cyberbullying. Absolutely. That schools are dealing There's with. There's another example. Um, where an anonymous statement can re- literally crush mm-hmm. uh, an adolescent's view of themselves mm-hmm. and, and lead to all sorts of self-destructive behavior. All you have to do uh, to see this is to look into the comments section of almost any um, major news outlet uh, if it isn't moderated and you see that most of the conversations degenerate very quickly into name calling and anger and rage. Um, so uh, there, the impact of that of that written technology there. There's an example of a written technology in which people's mm-hmm. people's names have been removed from what they write, so that they can all immediately post anonymously. That's um. That has troubling implications. On the one hand, of course, we all use it in our personal lives, um, and it's very useful. It has certainly led to certain kinds of um, changes in writing. People use all sorts of abbreviations because it's difficult to type with their thumbs and so on and so forth. <laughs> certainly LOL, difficult for me. <laughs> uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But uh, the, perhaps the that's that, and that's all of it's interesting. Uh, for a number of reasons recently, I've been thinking at any rate about the um, this huge social experiment we're involved in, in and, and the way it does affect language behavior, linguistic behavior and language use. Uh, it's, we have, I don't think, ever quite seen this kind of removal of, this, this extraordinary removal of uh, accountability. Of, of accountability. Mm-hmm. It did happen with with printing, and there there are, tr- you know, as well. Obviously, you could publish anonymously, but there was a much higher barrier to entry, mm-hmm. uh, both financially <laughs> and in terms of time and equipment. Now, there anybody with no a cell phone, to entry. there's absolutely no barrier. Um, I think people had overly optimistic ideas about what would what would happen mm. when this was unleashed. It reminds me of the movie Forbidden Planet, which is this a B grade science fiction movie with a. Uh, What's his name? Uh, 
I think Walter Pidgeon is in it, uh, from the 50s with flying saucers on strings and so on. But <laughs> but the story is great, and it's based, based on The Tempest. And what happens is um, these folks arrive on this, this spaceship arrives on this planet. There had been an expedition uh, many years before. They'd lost contact. The only people who are left are a scientist and his daughter, just like Prospero and Miranda, mm-hmm. and a robot who is just like Ariel, who's the model for Ro- Robbie the robot, I think, in uh, Lost in Space. And in, and uh, they can't figure out why ev- there's nobody left on the planet. It turns out, uh, after many plot machinations, that the inside of the planet is a gigantic machine. And um, what had happened was... Uh, this civilization had created a, a machine that would do their bidding mm. so that they didn't need to live in their bodies anymore and they could live forever because the machine would automatically connect with their minds and do their bidding and they flipped the switch, they turned it on and they all immediately killed each other. Monsters from the id is mm. the famous phrase in the film. <laughs> and uh, you know, we may be in a situation something like that right now That's where people have foreboding. no accountability for their language when yes. they write. Uh, and as a result, they they write, uh, they become, they behave very very badly. Right. Um, and, and we the see does this, their bidding. And the machine does their bidding. And um, uh, it's a huge experiment, and it's unclear how it's going to turn out. Well, you used the word electronic mob. Yeah. And and really, this anonymity that you reference is the equivalent of everyone wearing a mask in a mob. If we went out on the street and everyone was free to behave as they wanted because right. th- their faces were hidden, that would um, be a little bit frightening. So that is, interestingly enough, uh, uh, we are talking about language. That's why I make the distinction between, say, written language and spoken language, because yes. there are many people who write things and are free to write things anonymously now who would not say those things um, I think that's if, true. They, if, if they were accountable for them yes. personally. So, uh, you know, one way to attempt to deal with that would be to say, if you're going to moderate, have a uh, comment chain or a, a comment area in a in a social media or a news source, uh, any electronic platform, you only allow people to use verifiable identities to mm-hmm. make. You know, otherwise, you can't make comments. Mm-hmm. You have to be a subscriber, for example. Now, that would that wouldn't eliminate the problem, but it, it might um, it might have a salutary effect. So you've already said that you're not sure we've ever been in a situation quite like this where no. you were able to, to do this without identifying yourself. But my next question was looking at previous instances where language underwent dramatic change, mm-hmm. what can we predict about <laughs> the impact that that had on society, not just on governance, but really how individual people interact with each other? Well, it's very challenging. Um, you know, making predictions here, you have to have a little bit of hubris, I suppose. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Because, but the, 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 uh, the changes that are coming that are, are, are upon us are tremendous in that regard because of the technology. But this affects, again, writing more than speech. Uh, what does seem to happen is, and th- th- this is not news, to, especially young people seem, in fact not more connected, but um, more self-absorbed and more alienated from each other. If you simply look at the behavior, and this is not merely a linguistic behavior, it's a, it's a behavior 10 years ago, the idea that you would be in public and people would all be sort of staring at their laps mm-hmm. instead of speaking to each other and allowing electronic communication to interrupt every activity imaginable from the dinner table to the bedroom to the... Uh, to, to meetings, to uh, public events. Right, even it, walking, it would be walking on the sidewalk. You're walking on the sidewalk. Uh, it, it's, People literally die for this. They they drive, they text while they drive, they yeah. walk into traffic, They uh, right. and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we haven't mentioned is that these, these technological platforms have enabled political discourse, or I shouldn't say enabled, have... Um, caused political discourse to move into a venue that limits the speaker to a certain number of characters, not even mm-hmm. just words, but characters. Mm-hmm. What does that do to our ability to communicate complex ideas with each other? Uh, well, I think the, the, the answer is in the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, I mean, from, a, from a, a linguistic point of view, I mean, language is the form of 
of our thought. It, it shapes how we think, and our, how we think shapes our language. What does it mean to how we're thinking about complex problems? Well, it seems pretty clear that uh, I've taken to putting it this way, heavily influenced by the work of people like Neil Postman, who wrote the brilliant book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, mm -hmm. many decades ago, in which he foresaw much of this, as did Aldous Huxley, whom Postman cites in Brave New World, mm -hmm. which, he, which Postman suggests is a much more believable dystopia than 1984, in, in which the entire world has become seduced by entertainment. Uh, it may well be that the entire project of education through college and even graduate school is about the cultivation of long-form concentration. Because the kinds of activities that we undertake as at the upper ends of professions um, and that are crucial to the development of thoughtful discourse require time and concentration to unfold. And the progression you, through complex ideas. Yeah, an argument, an argument in this context, meaning not a disagreement, but uh, an attempt to persuade or to convince, mm -hmm. as one might make to pick a practical example before a jury or when making a business, a complicated business plan or when developing strategy for an institution or uh, when uh, conducting biomedical research. The kinds of skills that are required to do that are deeply counterintuitive and take tremendous training and practice and skill and they all involve the construction of long logical chains of argument, which cannot be uh, shortcut. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if, if, our, uh, if, if the kinds of uh, interactions that we're engaging in are based upon short, merely on short bursts, very, very short bursts of information, uh, you wind up with what many people have understandably called a culture of distraction rather than a, a culture of concentration. And if you're going to have a free, open, and democratic society, and you're going to have um, cultivate the ability to listen and to engage in civil discourse and conversation, in politics, in law, in, in research, in, uh, of all kinds, in then critical this is, thinking. This is uh, not a happy development. Not a happy development. Let me, let me give you another example of just how profound this is. And it, it's not about language, but it does have to do with language since what we're talking about is all of this, this communication going on through screens. Mm -hmm. Everything we can see in this room is a result of reflection, reflected light. When we read, even when print came in, from the beginning of time <laughs> until now, people communicated until very recently by looking at uh, pages that reflected light. The light shined onto the page, it bounced off the page, and then you could read it. Mm -hmm. I'd suggest that that has a very different impact on the brain than shining lights directly into it through the eyes. And every time you look at a screen, how could it not be different? We're human beings, we have bodies, we're mammals. We spent, when, when you have billions of people who have suddenly, very suddenly, in the course of Beginning with television and even movies are reflected light after all. Movies are light shown on a screen and reflected. That's very different from watching a television screen or a, a telephone screen or a computer screen. All of a sudden within the last well, generation and especially within the last ten, well, in the last generation, yeah. computers 30 years, 40 years, mm -hmm. um, and then the phones 2007 really. All of a sudden now people are primarily getting their information by having lights shown directly into their eyes. I can't believe that that isn't a, a substantially different in terms of the way the human brain responds and develops. And have you seen research suggesting as much? Or yes. You... Oh yeah, there is. I mean, uh, a lot of people are examining this. I uh -huh. haven't seen a lot of the neurological research, but right. uh, it, I'm sure it's out there. That I've, is seen, I've seen allusions idea. to it. Yeah. How could it not affect how we communicate when uh, shining lights into people's eyes hypnotizes them, uh, mesmerizes them? Well, television advertisers figured that out a long time exactly. ago. Exactly. <laughs> well, so 
Well, let me let me continue answering the question yeah, because okay. because um, Neil Postman again in this book, "Amusing Ourselves to Death," which you and I have talked about before, yes. I believe it's very readable. It's very short. It was written before the age of the internet. Even um, he was writing primarily about commercial uh, television, television, and he yeah. points out that the logic of the sequencing of visual imagery is radically different from the logic of syntax. Mm-hmm. Uh, it can uh, the. Images can be sliced and sequenced in any way one wishes. Sentences cannot, really. Uh, And the epistemological differences in the way one apprehends a a, a train of images through lights being shined into one's eyes Mm -hmm. is very, very different than what it means to construe arguments and sentences. And presumably, if we're going to continue to have the kind of society that, 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 well, I'd like to think is a good society, free, open, and democratic. Um, we're going to have to think clearly about that. It's really difficult to have a society where the, a democratic society where people are considering difficult social and political issues. What is truth? Which is a, a rather substantial issue for us right <laughs> Just now. Just a, a little uh, question. You know, what is, uh, 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 how, uh, how should we um, go about the process, for example, of nominating and confirming a Supreme Court justice? What, is, uh, what does it mean to be, what are, what are the standards of culpability for behavior under which circumstances, let alone various forms of rights and, and well, political and, issues? We have and, to be able to think about them in extraordinarily, I mean, th- these are complicated, difficult questions. We presumably have to be able to construct meaningful historical critical philosophical arguments and about as all of these important issues. as those questions are there are some that are, are actually more fundamental to the survival of the human race we have to decide how do we deal with environmental threats that that are name pick any issue it, right a number I agree of them completely. converging all at once there are uh, the how are we going to think about these things if 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 we can't sit still as an educator that puts you more or less on the front line of mm-hmm. that question. Mm-hmm. What are you seeing from students who have now grown up? Many of them have never known a time when they didn't have the cell phone in their hands. Well, I work primarily now with graduate students, and I work with people who are particularly interested in reading and writing. And uh, they're pretty committed, and they work they work hard, uh, but they are a self-selected group. Mm-hmm. Uh, I work with, but I've worked with every population imaginable, and I, I enjoy them all. Uh, I, I I find that the students are actually pretty similar to the way they've always been. There are many who are curious. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to learn. They're human beings. We uh, hear a lot, though, about the shrinking attention span of the young person. Is that not true? It may your... well be. It depends at what point you get them. I, uh, you know, I run my classroom when I'm dealing with young people in a pretty clear way. I don't. I tell them they have to put their computers and their phones away unless they have a special dispensation to use them for some disability, uh, because we're there to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're we're not there to be distracted. Uh, it has a particular function which I take very seriously, just as a kitchen is for particular things, and a bathroom is for particular things, and a church is for particular things, a classroom is for particular things, and what classrooms are really for. Even if there's a lecture going on, which sometimes has to happen, it's a particular kind of conversation. Well, you called it the cultivation of long-term concentration. Yeah. Well, and, and in this case, um, that, that people have to learn how to do on their own very often or mm-hmm. by themselves. Mm-hmm. But the conversations in the classroom presumably should depend upon that at the appropriate level for the students. You know, it's obviously very different if you're with fourth graders as opposed to mm-hmm. graduate students in uh, literature, but uh, it's all on a, on that continuum. Yes. Well, so far we've talked about changes in language and how they impact and shape important things like political discourse and whether we're going to solve <laughs> um, environmental problems of of great magnitude. Let's shift gears just a bit and talk about how these changes affect. Art, <laughs> our ability to tell stories, our ability to um, continue 
long and beautiful traditions like poetry. What is happening to our ability to create art? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, since we're talking about language, do you mean in, in language? Specifically, yes. It's a very hard question to answer. You always ask good questions. Well, according to the NEA, readership of poetry is up significantly in their latest study of reading, although readership of longer forms like the novel continues to slide. I believe I'm representing that accurately. Uh, human beings will never abandon storytelling. It's in our it, DNA. It is. It's in, There is no way for human beings not to make sense out of the world without telling some kind of a story. Uh, this gets, but the question of whether or not we're doing it particularly well or memorably, if this period will be remembered as an era of storytelling the way Elizabethan England was or Periclean Athens or the Harlem Renaissance, that's impossible to say. Mm -hmm. When it comes to poetry, I think, for many reasons, not having to do so much with language but with institutions, um, I'm not, I don't think we're in a golden age. Uh, the institutions, that's a vague word. What do you mean? Oh, the ins publishing, mm -hmm. uh, academic institutions. Um, mm, what about visual media like movies? And well, I'm not as much of an expert there. I mean, it mm -hmm. seems as though there there's certainly a lot of good work being made, although the people who teach screenwriting in our program believe that the greatest amount of creativity is going on in television. Mm -hmm. uh, that may be particularly strong work, certainly. There's certainly mm -hmm. a lot more opportunity there than there used to be, and I know that a number of people are very excited about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more concerned with words, per se. Yeah. Uh, well, and so in light of what Postman had to say about mm -hmm. um, the impact of television and how you can cut images and sounds together that do not necessarily follow the logic of syntax, they don't also do not necessarily follow the logic of story as we've known it forever. That's which true. Is an oral tradition. And so the question really becomes how is is story itself under threat? Oh, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, you know, the great avant-garde French novelist Alain Robguet many years ago, many decades ago once said, you know, uh, I believe that a story should have a beginning and a middle and an end, just not necessarily in that order. <laughs> I think an, it, I, it's such a huge question. Human beings are always going to tell stories, and there are some good, there are some very good storytellers out there. Postman's point is that uh, television isn't bad at what it does. It's it, it's it's a very interesting argument. He says the problem is it's so good at what it does that it turns everything into entertainment, in, and this leads to the problem of fake news. Or the problem, mm -hmm. of, uh, the problem of, of, of being able to tell what is true and what is not, because the structure mm -hmm. of all stories is so similar uh, on, uh, on the tube that right. uh, you, th they're structured in exactly the same way. And we've seen, this is a disturbing trend that we see more and more of, is the interpenetration of, um, of, of fiction with the representation, the supposed representation of, of truth in, in news, so that figures from these two worlds uh, cross over. Pesman argues that the problem with the news is not that it um, do it doesn't engage in good storytelling, it's that it is subject to the entertainment values of the medium as a whole. And so everything becomes a form of entertainment. That includes education, mm -hmm. uh, politics, oh, in the classroom. religion, and so on. And, that's yeah. a, and he argues that that's, uh, well, again, it's like a social experiment with no control. And we are living in the midst of that now where, in fact, the news shows are very, very similar to the entertainment shows. So it becomes very difficult to tell uh, the difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you were to put on um, your wizard's hat and gaze into a crystal ball, <laughs> and, um, looking forward, what is the next step? The next necessary step in human evolution in how we deal with language and, and particularly 
uh, integrating some of these things that we've been talking about. Where can we go from here? Well, since we've been talking about media a lot, it seems to me that, uh, and long form concentration and education, it seems to me tremendously important that we are careful to develop and cultivate institutions uh, where there is still a commitment to teaching young people especially about um, the history history of, of everything, but in the case of training people to tell stories, mm -hmm. uh, to, to teach them the history of that, those modes of storytelling mm -hmm. so that they, they really understand what it means and, and why it matters and why human beings have always cared so much about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that Stephen King didn't invent storytelling. I think Stephen King is a very fine writer, but he didn't invent storytelling, yeah. nor would he ever claim Claimed that he had. To. Right. Uh, he, you know that uh, I think it, it, it's it, it's crucial that we sustain somehow, not necessarily in universities, but somehow the uh, the kind of conversations and community that will help people to think about fictional and true stories in clear ways and then perhaps to make them as well. Finally, well, my final question then is, do you see anything around you now that gives you hope that we're actually moving <laughs> in that direction in spite of what seems to be a tidal wave of, um, you know, less than hopeful signs? Well, there are a lot of very bright people out there. And every community has and, them. And thinkers and every community has them. So when we talk about institutions that matter, that, that little festival that, that that I've put together, that's one of them. It's small, mm -hmm. but it brings together people who are paying attention to these things and doing their best to keep uh, keep the, the integrity of language alive, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There are many ways to do this. I would suggest that if people care about it, what they should, one of the things they should do is uh, interact with real people in real time <laughs> and 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 mm -hmm. uh, and words that don't move on screens. I, I I I think that's important. Whatever so, they do, they have to be able to cultivate that long form concentration. Otherwise, we're not going to have stories that are meaningful. We're just going to have static. For a long time, we've uh, been exhorting young people to get outside, and now we can add get in a conversation. Yeah, and here I'm referring. We've talked about him as well to the great English moral and political philosopher Michael Oakeshott, who said that ultimately education is not about the transfer of information or the acquisition of skill, but it's about learning how to participate in different kinds of conversations and mm. learning which conversation it is that you are in and how to participate in it for its own sake. Uh, and that's tremendously important. If we don't retain that, we're going to have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Well, David, I'm pleased to count you among those bright people out there moving us in this direction. And thanks for joining me today. It's always a pleasure, Alan. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think People. Mm -hmm.